Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most beneficent and most merciful, I want to greet all of you with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum. Well, all of you know the greeting, right? That means may God's peace and mercy be upon each single one of you. So this is the greeting we Muslims greet we each other when we meet each other. But you'll be surprised to find out that this was exactly the same greeting that Jesus used to greet his disciples with. Those who are from the Christian faith, you'll be surprised to find out that uh, when Jesus met his uh, disciples at the upper chamber, it says in Gospel of John chapter 20 verse number 19, the very first thing he mentioned to them was peace be upon you. You could have been anywhere, but uh, you are sincere when I was interacting with Ron and Lance and so many people. You came here because you want to sincerely study Islam, not from some fake news or fake news, but from real Muslims. So on behalf of all the Muslims, we want to congratulate you and give you a big round of applause for coming here. Thank you. A few weeks ago, my wife and I, we were driving towards the downtown. And this was the scene that we saw from the Dan Ryan from 1994. And this is the Chicago skyline. And I was quizzing my sons and daughter, and I was asking them, you know the two buildings that you see up here? This one and this one. What do you think those buildings are? So if I'm going to ask you that question, what would you say? What are these two buildings? This one and this one. Sears Tower and John Hancock building. Now here is my question to you. What two things that they have in common? I mean, they are, they are tall, obviously, right? <laughs> they have antennas on the top. They are black. They are part of the Chicago skyline. But two important things that they have in common. And there is a point I'm trying to make. They are both the first and the second tallest building in the Chicagoland area. And number two is, they were both built by a Muslim architect. Yes. You know, many a times when we think of the Muslims, uh, we think of them as, you know, foreigners. They don't belong here. They're immigrants. They're not from us. But just the uh, Chicago skyline itself give us the testimony that Muslims are part and parcel of United States of America literally for decades and yes for centuries. Well, he passed away, Dr. Fazlur Rahman. Who do you think is uh, the best-selling poet in all of the US like now in 2019? Well, a hint is he's a Muslim and nobody Googles the answer now. You, you know it. Rumi. Rumi, yes. Jalaluddin Rumi, he is, he was born in Persia 800 years ago. But even now, today, 2019, he has such a profound influence that his poems and his books are still the best sellers in the USA in the 21st century. So again, the influence that Muslims had and are having. What do you think uh, these three individuals have in common? And they all have commonality in the context of USA. Any raise of hands? Extra falafel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was surprised some of you were enjoying falafel, right? <laughs> the Sultan of Morocco or the country of Morocco became the very first country who recognized the independence of USA of all the countries in the world. So it was a Muslim country. When the USA was young and small and needed support, it were the Muslims from the very beginning who came and gave the support, a Muslim country. The second country was the country of Netherlands. The third one was none other again a Muslim land the Sultan of Mysore. Sometimes the media makes it appears that Muslims are new to the USA, but so when do you think Muslims started to come to the USA initially? Yes, what would you say? There you go, give her a big hand, she got it. 1529, yes. Was that a guess? Yeah, there was a guess, right? You must be good in taking exams. <laughs> Wonderful. So according to New York Times, Muslims started to come here way back in the 1500s. Yeah, Muslims, as part of being Americans, they took part in the war, sacrificing their time, their wealth, and with their lives. We don't know that. Many of us, we don't know that, right? They don't teach this in schools and colleges. So we need to appreciate the contributions done by many societies, many races and cultures, and definitely the Muslims. 
as Americans. So then what is the faith that Muslims that we believe in? Some Ron was asking me the question, do you guys worship the God called Allah, correct? It's a good question, but people may assume, people may think that when we say the word Allah, they think that we have a different God. That's not the case. As you see from the slide, Every language may have a different name for the same creator. Like the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, the name for God is none other than Yahweh or Jehovah. In Spanish language, it is Dios. In Norwegian, it is God. In English, it is the creator. In the language of Jesus, which is Aramaic language, it is Ilaha, Allaha. And in Arabic, it is Allah. The same, the same God in different languages run. So we don't worship a different God. Allah is not the God of the Muslims, the Arabs, the tribal God, no, the same creator. So what are some of the attributes of this creator? So we say that God has many attributes. We say God is eternal. We say God is the powerful, the most powerful. He is all knowing, merciful, forgiving, loving, guiding creator. So we say that when God created Adam and Eve, he did not left Adam and Eve alone on their own human shortcomings. So from the very beginning, God started to guide them. So here are some commonalities and slight differences between Islamic version of Adam and Eve and the biblical version of Adam and Eve. So let me ask you this question. When God commanded them that enjoy all the things but stay away from this specific fruit or specific tree, who was the very first one tempted by the serpent and made the very first mistake? Yeah, all of you know that, right? Eve. Islam also has a similar story, but here is a slight difference. According to the Islamic story, according to the Quran, both Adam and Eve equally they committed the very first sin. So we say that, you know, we speak about equality. Equality in Islam started from day one. The second commonality that we have is that the sin that was committed by Adam and Eve, or the mistake I should say, according to the Bible, you know, all of us, according to the Bible, right, we inherited called something called the original sin. But according to the Islamic story, after they were sent on earth, Adam and Eve, they both asked God for forgiveness. That, oh God, please forgive us. We made the mistake. They were sincere. They were repenting to God. And the story in the Quran is, God forgave them. So the sin that they committed, God forgave their sin and that was the end of story. So according to Islam, we don't inherit their sin. So a baby born in Islam is born without any blemish, without any sin, pure and innocent. They are accountable once they reach the age of puberty, once the choices that they make. So we have the story of the original goodness. So what we say is that all the prophets, so these are some of the prophets of God who are mentioned in the Quran. You may have seen posters out there that has names of wonderful prophets, right? Some of you, you have seen the posters. So there are 25 prophets mentioned by name in the Quran. The very first one is Adam. The very first human is the first prophet in Islam. And the last one is none other than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And as you can see, Jesus is considered as a mighty prophet. But let me ask you know, one more quiz question because all of you had some like really good lunch. I don't want you guys to sleep, right? <laughs> so here is my next question. Of all the prophets mentioned in the Quran, who do you think is mentioned the most by name in the Quran? The Muslims, you guys know the answer. So let's give the, the guest the first chance. Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's mentioned one of the least number of times by name in the Quran. <laughs> I would be guessing the same if I were you. <laughs> I will give you a hint, right? And then I will give you the chance to answer that. Just you. The same prophet who is the most mentioned in the Quran by name is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. His name starts with the letter M. Okay. That's all the hints I can give. All right, she got it. Give her a big hand. Good job. All right. Can you imagine the commonalities that we have, right? Moses, peace be upon him, mentioned 136 times in the Quran. The second most mentioned prophet is none other than Abraham. In the Quran, mentioned 69 times. Jesus is mentioned 25 times. Adam is 25 times. Muhammad, peace be upon him, five. That again is an indication that if Quran was coming from the mind of Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
why did he not praised himself more number of times in the Quran? So we say Quran is coming from God himself and he was just conveying the message. But here is one more quiz question for you. You know, this is kind of a cheating because all of you saw the posters out there, but still I will ask you the question. There is only one lady mentioned by name in the Quran. Who do you think that lady is? Ron, this is for you. Mary. All right, give her a big, give her a big hand, you got it. <laughs> She's mentioned 32 times in the Quran with respect and honor and love and, you know. In fact, to such a degree that the whole chapter 19 is named after Mary, the mother of Jesus. Chapter number 3, verse number 42 says, God sent an angel to Mary and this angel is saying to Mary, that, oh Mary, God has chosen you. God has purified you and God has chosen you above all the ladies. This distinction is not given to the mother of Muhammad, peace be upon him, not his wife, not his daughter, not any one of the believing ladies of the 7th century. This distinction is given to a lady who came 600 years before Muhammad, peace be upon him. So that again shows, you know, Ran, that Quran is not the words or it's not the composition of Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is coming from God and he's just sharing the message. So last but not the least on this slide, what we say is that as humanity was expanding all over the world, then God to guide humanity, he started to send commandments to the humans and he chose messengers and prophets. And these are some of them. Not all of them. So it says in chapter 16, verse number 36, that God appointed prophets and messengers and their message was one. That humanity should only worship the creator and not the creation. So submitting to the creator, in Arabic there is one word in Arabic for that concept of submission, submitting to the creator. Can you guess what that one word is? Peace, so what is the Arabic for peace or submission to God? It starts with the letter I, S. Islam, yes. So we say that Islam was the main message that was given by God to all the prophets and messengers. In his generic uh, definition, it means a person is submitting to God. Submitting to God means only worshipping one God, following God's commandments. So we say that that was the message of all the prophets and messengers, including Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon him. So here are some of uh, the references from the Old Testament and the New Testament. As we can see, those from the Christian and the Jewish faith, you will find out that uh, the oneness of God was preached by Noah, by Abraham, by Moses, by Isaiah, and by all the prophets, absolute oneness of God. Even if you look at the Ten Commandments, uh, which are in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse number 3 says, you should only have one God, no other God besides me. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, it says in Mark chapter 12, verse number 28, a person came to Jesus and asked him a million dollar question that of all the commandments, which one is the first, the greatest of all of them? And the Jewish people used to have 613 commandments. Jesus, peace be upon him, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is only one. Worship him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and that is the first commandment. So obviously what happened was humanity, they diluted the concept of God and they moved away from worshipping only one God and they started to worship somebody or something else besides God. So God appointed prophets and messengers to bring people back to monotheism. So in that way, all the prophets were sent, including the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And these are some of the references from the Quran that speaks about the oneness of God. So these are some of the prophets, as you can see, the Arabic names and the Old Testament or the English names. Jesus, his name is Esau in the Quran. That's the Arabic name. Musa for Moses. Ibrahim for Abraham. Yusuf for Joseph. Common names, right? So again, one of the reasons we are having this open house is that we need to learn from each other. We need to inform each other because there is so much fear of the unknown which is out there. So when people, when we come and meet with each other, we will find out that there are so many things in common. And Brother Ashwak, as he mentioned, and this is one of the purpose of the Majid al Rahma Foundation, is that we want to work on the commonalities that we have. Yes, there are always differences. We don't want to fight on the differences. 
we want to educate each other but what the purpose is to come on the commonalities the platform of commonalities so we can work together to form better societies so that's the whole gist of this open house now what are the six important beliefs and what are the five pillars of islam so the most important belief that we have is to believe in the absolute oneness of god we say that god is one in one not in multiple persons not in multiple entities absolute oneness is the most fundamental belief in islam the second one is to believe in the angels that god has created that all the prophets that God has appointed to guide humanity. We believe in all the books that God has given to the previous prophets. You know, there is a poster, as you may have seen in the cafeteria section, it says the books of God. And it mentions the books that were given to Abraham and Moses and David and yes, Jesus. So I cannot be a Muslim if I don't believe in those books as they came in the original form. And then we say that the Quran was sent down or given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, not only as a guidance to him or the Arabs, but to all of humanity. So we say this is the study guide, right? This is the study guide that God has given to all of humanity. So I don't have a monopoly, neither does brother Ashwaq or the Arabs. And then we believe in the day of judgment. This is so important. We say this life, not we say all of you believe in this anyway. This life is a short life. One day we have to pass away just like people before us passed away. But then that is not the end of our existence. The Quran says that God is going to bring us back to life again. So there would be a day of resurrection and a day of judgment. You know, just like in our schools and colleges, the teacher, the professor evaluates us. Just like at our, at our work, there is an evaluation, six month, three month, one year evaluation. We say that on the day of judgment, every single person would be standing in front of God and God would be evaluating us based upon two things. What kind of belief that you had and what kind of deeds that you have done. So if a person, according to the Quran, chapter number two, verse number 25, has the right belief, means only worshiping one God, believing him alone, following his guidance and trying his best to follow the scripture and doing good deeds, helping humanity and the neighbors, the poor, the hungry, be the ambassador of peace, then God by his mercy, not by our deeds, God by his mercy will put that person into paradise. But on the flip side of it, just like when we went to schools and colleges, if we don't obey the teacher, the attendance policy, maybe the dress code, the quizzes, the assignment, the finals, if we don't do the way the teacher is saying, there would be consequences. So we say that yes, there is going to be a hellfire. The Quran speaks about the hellfire. Uh, and obviously it's not me or the Muslims to say, you know, this person is going here, this person is going there. God is going to be the ultimate and the final and the fair judge of that. All we can say is in the Quran, this is the criteria. A person has to have the right belief, worshiping only one God and right to have and also have the right deeds. That's when God's mercy comes into play. What do you think are the five pillars of Islam? This is a quiz question to you guys. Our guest, raise your hand, say one, and we will help you with the next, inshallah, Ron. The Hajj. The Hajj, right? What is the Hajj? Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. Yes. There you go. So Hajj is the pilgrimage. So once in a lifetime, a Muslim is obligated to go there. So I performed my pilgrimage like six years ago. It's an awesome feeling. Once you go there, just imagine three million people, the whole population of Chicago coming together in one place. We are all from different colors, nationalities, languages, uh, you know, backgrounds, but all coming together, worshiping one God, standing shoulder to shoulder. That creates a sense of, we are all part of one family. You know, Malcolm X, when he went there, way back 1960s or so, he had such a profound experience, you know, before he went there, he used to have a racist mentality, right? We know it from history. But after going there, he, he prayed with the whitest of the white, he ate with them, he socialized with them. It had such a profound effect on him that he wrote a letter from Mecca to his friends in the US saying that if America also embraces Islam, all the racial problems are going to go away. What is the second, third, fourth and fifth pillar? Prayer, right? Yes. So we pray five times a day. The very first prayer is before sunrise. The second prayer early afternoon, then late afternoon, then right after sunset, then when it becomes dark. These are the five prayers. Really quick footnote on the prayer. How many of you have seen Muslims pray before? Okay, some of you. The way that we pray, we wash ourselves, we are standing in front of God, we want to be pure. Secondly, we fold our hands and we have certain recitation and the important thing is we prostrate 
putting our forehead on the ground, worshiping one God. And lo and behold, all the prophets of God of the Old and the New Testament, they used to pray exactly the same way. Abraham, it says in Genesis 17, 3, when the time for prayer came, John, Ron, he went to a secluded place, put his forehead on the ground, he was praying to one God. It speaks about Jesus. When the people were coming after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane and over there he prostrated and he prayed to one God. According to Matthew chapter 26 verse number 39. And Muslims when we pray, we are praying exactly the same way because we are following the rituals and the message of all the prophets and messengers. Okay, three more pillars to go. Okay, Ramadan, right? The month of Ramadan, fasting, yes. We fast in the month of Ramadan. So just like in the solar calendar, we have 12 months. In the lunar calendar, we have 12 months. Just like in the solar calendar, September is the ninth month. In the lunar calendar, Ramadan, the name, is the ninth month. In that month, a Muslim is obligated to fast from dawn to sunset the whole month. And lo and behold, this is the way that previous prophets, they also used to fast, in, including Jesus. Matthew 4, 2 says that he used to fast that many days. Uh, two more to go, you were saying something. Alms giving, yeah, charity. So the notion of charity in Islam is that anything extra that I have, the poor people, they also have a right on my wealth. Wow, it changes the paradigm, right? It's not just you, God has given you the property. So a certain percentage of my wealth, I'm supposed to give to the poor, the needy, the homeless. If I don't do that, I would be committing sin in God because they have a right on my wealth. Two more to go. Is it two more? One more to go. Okay, sorry, wrong. <laughs> one more, right? So, and the, the one that you're missing is the biggest of them all, the very first pillar. Yeah. There you go. Not just believe in one God, but to testify in the oneness of God. Means, so in Arabic it goes like this, and I will do the translation. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. The translation is, I bear witness that there is no other God besides one God, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So we testify this many times in our prayer and also outside of the prayer. You know, in this mosque, many mosques, our non-Muslim fellow Americans, they come and say, you know what, I have been learning about Islam. I read the Quran. I feel that Islam is for me. And they say that, how do I convert to Islam? We say, Let's understand Islam better and to formally convert to Islam, we don't have baptism, other rituals. A person has to recite the testimony of faith. That's how a person by their own choice converts to Islam. So with that being said, I want to give a lot of time for you for Q&A, but let me end with this Quranic verse. And this verse is from chapter 49, verse number 13. Addressing to all of humanity, God is saying, our Creator is saying that, O mankind, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into nations and peoples and tribes that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and despite and discriminate with each other, you get to know each other. And then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered person. So we hope and pray, and this is the Quranic principle, that all of us as brothers and sisters in humanity, if we work together with God's guidance as a big family, inshallah, God willing, we can eradicate you know, anti-Semitism and racism and violence and Islamophobia, and inshallah, God willing, we can create societies which are based upon morality, which are based upon unity, which are based upon equality and justice and peace, and once we do that, inshallah, God willing, not only we can make America great again, we can make the whole humanity great again and may God help us all. Thank you very much.